by uh, explaining the format rather that we're going to follow, I shall just say a few words, a few minutes of general introduction to this evening's uh, debate. And then my two uh, colleagues here will each speak for about 20 minutes or 55 minutes to the, uh, the subject of the meeting. The idea then is that I mediate some sort of discussion between them. I'm not quite sure what that means. Anyway, we're going to try that out for another 20 minutes or so. And then the floor will be thrown open to anybody to take part in the general free ball that's still mediated by me. <laughs> that's the idea. Actually, when thinking about this meeting, I was struck by the title because about, uh, I think, 12 years ago at Imperial College, the Roman Catholic chaplaincy organised a debate which was called Spirit, Mind and Matter. And a similar title for this evening. Spirit was handled by the Roman Catholic chaplain, reasonable. The college doctor was drafted in to talk about mind. <coughs> yours truly got left with matter, it was appropriate for physics. It was a very pleasant evening. What was curious about the way it was conducted was there was an in, inbuilt supposition that each of the three of us would speak to our appropriate disciplines. And although we were politely respectful towards the other two, it was made fairly clear that we couldn't cross across the boundaries. So there was no great disagreement, but also no great sparks were, were struck, and nothing very exciting happened. Now, this problem is certainly one we face in, in academic life today. It's still the case, in spite of all uh, invocations for interdisciplinary work and so on, that by and large people do not talk to each other across the academic divide. What is interesting is, however, that even within the sciences themselves, you can see in recent years, uh, movements are beginning to be thrown up, scientific movements, which are tending to negate this trend. Of course, this is something I imagine everybody here will welcome very, very strongly. For example, in psychology, certainly, this is not so recent, uh, I always think of Freud as being the ultimate reductionist, single track, monochromatic, brilliant writer, and Jung as the great eclectic, uh, mystic, uh, uh, bringing together of things. And I think it's no coincidence, in fact, that many people, or most people, who advocate bringing things together in the sciences and humanities also do uh, to vote Jung on their, on their side. In modern physics, of course, we also have very curious tensions these days. On the one hand, we have the determinism of classical physics, again, a rigid Newtonian world clock view of reality. And of course, set against that is the probabilism quantum theory, the insistence that the world is in fact not determinable in an ordinary sense. Of course, ideas in chaos are never even worse. And these, these tensions, you can still see there in the way both we teach physics and the way we practice physics. Um, but perhaps most of all, one sees this in biology. It's curious that most modern biologists, certainly most academic biologists, still wish to portray themselves in the light of Newtonian physics. They somehow want to uh, give the impression that they are as rigidly deterministic as were the physicists of the last century. So it's a strange thing. One sees it all the time. So, for example, the typical biological view we have these days, from the, the official one, as it were, is a very mechanistic view of life. Um, evolution is seen strictly as Darwinism, pure and simple, nothing more to be said. Uh, we have the triumph of molecular biology, as to say that life itself is nothing but complicated molecules of motion. And then finally, of course, we have the notion that consciousness is merely secondary to matter, an epiphenomenon, nothing of interest in itself, tied up with behaviourist views of, of psychology and so on. But what I personally find very exciting, someone who's not a biologist and doesn't understand the technicalities in detail, is that there are these movements in biology itself which want to oppose this, this point of view. Uh, thus, for example, we do have the view that evolution may have been directed in some sense, this could be a religious perspective, it could be something else, but nonetheless the idea it wasn't just a series of cosmic accidents. Certainly, the view that life is more than just its molecular constituents is one which I think many people would hold for many different reasons, uh, and I think that's, a, to me, a very important idea. And, of course, finally, the idea that mind itself is more than just organised matter, there's more to the human psyche than just the uh, levels of neurotransmitters and so on in our brain. Now, as I say, these tensions have come up through the sciences, and you can see them at work in the academic world. What, however, is much more dramatic, and indeed much more challenging, is to cross right across the sciences. As I say, this is what people still tend not to do. There's a great, well, academics have a vested interest in this. We each are barons in our own empire, and we don't want to share the glory with your neighbour. Now, the thing about both of our talkers this evening is that they, in their own way, in their own separate discipline, they are both known and well known for their attempts to grasp this central challenge of bringing together not just different ideas within the science, but science as a whole, and indeed crossing across the humanities as well. So uh, I do feel this evening we have two exceptionally well qualified speakers, and I'm certainly looking forward very much to the, uh, the, the business we're now about to, uh, to take.
Now, let me get on to the speakers themselves. The, the, I'll introduce them just before the individual talks. The first speaker is Russell Sennard, someone I've known for many, many years. Russell is a professor of physics at the Open University, where he works in high energy particle physics. That's an area that's distinguished by being both the cutting edge of science and also the cutting edge of technology. If you've seen some of these machines that these people use, they're absolutely incredible in terms of engineering. They're very advanced on the edge of, of modern science. But Russell also, very unusual for Pastor Physics, is a reader in the, the Church of England, which reflects, of course, the fact he has a very strong and dedicated uh, interest in religion, in particular in the relation between religion and science. Uh, he's becoming more and more known as a broadcaster. You may have seen him on television quite recently, I certainly did. Um, and he's been on several programs in the last year or two. But most specifically on radio, you, you start to come on the radio these days, you can't hear Russell's voice booming out. <laughs> it's not either in the morning or evening. <laughs> Particularly at the moment, I would draw your attention to a very, um, a very exciting series, a very expensive series actually, called Science and Wonders, which is being broadcast on Radio 4 on Wednesdays at 7.20. And I think it's something that the BBC has committed itself to. It's, it's a five program. A series of five programs on this on this topic area. I think that's a tremendous development in itself. And in particular tomorrow, uh, the topic is God in the mind, and certainly the next two of today. The final thing I'll say about Russell before handing over to him is he's also a very good writer of books. He has a very famous series of books called Uncle Albert Plus, where Uncle Albert explains to a 12 year old various things about modern science. And I fact bought my daughter. Uh, one thing, it's unclouded from relativity, I think that's what it's called. Uh, when she was a father, and I'm delighted to say she now wants to follow her father's footsteps and have a career as a business. So <laughs> I think that's Russell's uh, doing well. Than that. So it's a great pleasure, and I invite Russell Stella to be the first of our two speakers to address the topic of matter, life, and soul towards a new world view. Thank you very much. Um, when, when David uh, wrote to me originally and uh, asked whether I could possibly sort of stand in at short notice with Keith Ward, who couldn't make it tonight, I thought to myself, now hold on, the 16th of April, that rings a bell. I think I'm doing something that night. And I looked up my diary, and sure enough, I did have another engagement for tonight. I was due to be here listening to Keith Ward. <laughs> 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 so that's how I come to be here. And like you, I too am disappointed to be here with myself rather than Keith. <laughs> anyway, I've just got about 20 minutes, um, which isn't very long. Uh, I could, I suppose, take one particular topic and do that in, in some detail. But well, the alternative is to take a whole lot of topics and do them in no detail at all. And I thought, well, seeing that this is supposed to be a dialogue and I'm supposed to be provoking you to sort of take part, um, I'll adopt the second uh, approach and adopt a scattergun uh, technique uh, with the idea that not surely one of the topics or questions I raise uh, might attract some interest somewhere. Anyway, we're going to be looking at uh, uh, matter, life and soul. Um, given my background as a physicist, I suppose I ought to be the one out of two speakers to concentrate mostly on, on matter, so let's begin with matter, space, and time, in other words, the universe. Now, here in our particular corner of the universe, we're of course completely dominated by the sun, which is huge. You know, one million Earths would fit inside the sun. Uh, so it's quite salutary to learn that, in fact, the sun is just a star, just like any other star, and there are an awful lot of stars. There are 100,000 million stars in the Milky Way galaxy. Now, I can't wrap my mind around a, a number like that, so the way I think about it is, suppose we were going to give every star a name, and why not? Our star's got a name, it's called the sun. Uh, well, each of us would have to come up with 20 different names. When I say each of us, I mean every man, woman, and child on Earth would have to come up with 20 different names, and then we would, would have just enough to name each star in the galaxy. And then, of course, there are more than one galaxy. There are, in fact, 100,000 million galaxies, so now we need 20 names each just to name the galaxies. And each of those have got 100,000 million stars in them. So there's a lot of matter. Not only that, but it's spread out over an, an absolutely enormous volume. Um, light, as you know, travels very fast, 300,000 kilometers per second. But even at that speed, it takes 15,000 million years for light to come from the farthest depths of space uh, to ourselves. So the universe is big. 
When we look at those galaxies, we find that they are all retreating. They're all receding off into, into the distance. Uh, the further away they are, the, the faster they're going. So if you imagine taking a, a film of all this, or a video, and then running the video backwards, what would you see? You'd see all the galaxies coming together. The farthest off ones have got further to go, but they're traveling faster, so in fact it all ends up together at the same time. Uh, if you run the, the video the right way, the way it actually happened, everything started off squashed together, and then suddenly there was a big bang, and everything exploded. And those galaxies are still receding as a result of the, that initial explosion. And that explosion, the Big Bang, happened a long time ago, 15,000 million years ago. Okay, so uh, that's the universe. Now, how are we supposed to react to it? Well, in olden days, if you pick up the Bible and you look at what the psalmist has to say, the uh, psalmist, looking up at the heavens, saw it as declaring the, the majesty of God. That, of course, was before we knew quite how big the universe was. Um, and I suppose today, if you ask people how they react to, to the, the starlit night and their knowledge of just what it means, uh, we would tend to think of it perhaps as being more a reflection of our own insignificance rather than the greatness of God. We look at it and we think, now can we really think of this kind of universe as being intended as a home for humans? As a kind of over design, don't you think? Um, and even if you think in terms of, you know, not just life here on Earth, if you think of the possibility of life on planets going around some of those other stars. You know, we don't know whether there is life out there. It's still very much a, a debating point. But it seems to me very likely that there is life out there. Uh, it, it still seems rather big. You know, for a uh, hammer to crack a walnut if you just simply wanted to have uh, life in the universe. And, of course, when you look at the universe, so much of it just seems to be very hostile to life. You know, stars are incredibly hot, you know, sort of 10 million degrees in their interiors. Um, if you get too far away from a star, then it's too cold for life, and so on. It was thoughts like that that prompted uh, Stephen Weinberg in his famous book, The First Three Minutes, to say, the more the world is comprehensible, the more it appears pointless. And he described life as a more or less farcical outcome of a chain of accidents. Now all that was said, though, before the realization of something called the anthropic principle. I don't have time to go into that in great detail, but I can fill it in later on in the discussion if you want to. But essentially the anthropic principle is saying that actually the, the universe isn't as hostile to life as you might think. In fact, there's something very strange going on because if you uh, decided to, um, in your mind's eye, create a universe where you throw together a whole bunch of made-up physical laws, where you, you change the gravitational constant, and you change the mass of the electron and the size of electric charge, and things of that kind, you just throw together a whole bunch of laws, and you say, what kind of universe would that give rise to? And the answer is, it would be a universe which wouldn't have life in it, because life certainly could not develop. For example, if you start off with a big bang, uh, you've got to get the violence of the big bang right. If you make it too violent, then the gas coming out of the big bang just simply disperses. You don't get conglomerations of, of stars and galaxies and things, so there's no life. On the other hand, if you don't make it violent enough, if you turn the wick down, if you like, uh, if the, you get your expansion, you get your galaxies forming, but then the whole thing recollapses down into a big crunch. And that's the end of the universe, and that happens before you've had a chance for life to develop. And it's taken 15,000 million years for us to be here, and the big crunch would come before that. So you've got to get the violence of the Big Bang rack. You then got to face up the fact that all you're getting out of the Big Bang is hydrogen and helium, the two lightest gases, and you can't make beautiful objects like these out of hydrogen and helium. 
And where's that going to come from? You've got to find some way of fusing the hydrogen and helium together to form a more complicated nuclei for the other kinds of atoms you're going to need. So you're going to need a furnace of some kind, so you've got to make absolutely sure that in your universe you have stars, because that's where, in this universe, the, the bigger molecules, the, the bigger nuclei are made. It's actually quite tricky to make uh, a star. You know, you've got to make sure that your gravitational constant is big enough so that you collect enough gas together that it, when it squashes down, it heats up enough to trigger the nuclear process. So you must make your, your gravitational force too <laughs> weak. On the other hand, you mustn't make it too strong. Because if you do that, you'll collect too much gas together. The fire will, will catch light, but then it will burn so fiercely that the, 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 the star will have burnt itself out within just one million years, and that's not good enough if you need to have a constant source of energy to allow evolution to take place on the planet. So you've got that problem. You've got the problem that having uh, fused your uh, nuclei together in the middle of a star, you can't make human beings in the middle of a star at 10 billion degrees. So somehow you've got to get the stuff out. And what actually happens in this universe is that when a very uh, large uh, star gets to the end of its useful life, it, it implodes. And that gives rise to an explosion, a supernova explosion, which blasts this material out. All of us, all this material here, was once in a star. It's been blasted out in a supernova explosion. Now, how can an implosion give rise to an explosion? It's taken astrophysicists a very long time to work out how that happened. And in your imaginary universe, where you're just throwing laws of physics together at random, you better make sure you've got some way of getting the stuff out of those stars. And so on can go on and on. There's a whole string of coincidences which go under the name of the anthropic principle. And so what it means, in, 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 in summary, is that if you uh, just throw together your laws of nature uh, in, in a haphazard fashion, your chances of having life in that universe are considerably less than the chance of winning first prize in the lottery. And yet, our universe, our actual universe, managed to do that. Now, how? Now, there are two um, possibilities uh, that we know of. One is that it was fixed in that way. You know, there was a designer, in other words, there was a god. Uh, or the alternative is that there is a very large number of universes, perhaps an infinite number of universes, and they are all run on different lines according to their own uh, laws of nature, their own spaces and times, if they have spaces and times. Um, and in the vast majority of them, there is no life because they got one of the conditions wrong. But on the occasional freak occasion, you happen by chance, purely by chance, to get the right set of conditions, and that will then give rise to life. And we, being a form of life, obviously have to find ourselves in one of the freak universes. So that's an alternative way of explaining the anthropic principle, and it's up to you to make up your own mind if you think is the more plausible of those suggestions. Okay, now another interesting thing about the Big Bang is that we think it was the creation of the, of the universe, not the creation of the universe. But that means not just uh, that it saw the creation of all the matter and energy and all the contents of the universe, it also marked the creation of space and the beginning of time. There was no time before the Big Bang, because there was no before. You can't use the word before in connection with the Big Bang. Now, um, that, for, for some people, is, 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 is very significant. Um, if you've read um, uh, Stephen Hawking's A Brief History of Time, when he points out that there was no time before the incident of the Big Bang, um, then he goes on to say, what place then for a creator? And I suppose most uh, religious people, when they think about God the creator, they have the mental picture of, uh, in the beginning there was God, and he was all on his own. At some stage he got bored, uh, thought he'd like to have someone to talk to, apart from his son and the Holy Spirit. Um, and so he thought, right, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll make some people. And so he, he likes to do a touch paper and retires with a big bang, and we're on our way. 
Now, that's the way you think, or have any friends that think, just tell them, that, sorry, that's out, that, that just won't work. There was no God before the Big Bang, because there was no before. It's a meaningless question to ask what was before the Big Bang. Now, some people say, ha ha, that's one in the eye of the richest people. You know, that, that, that's really got them poised by their guitar, but uh, they don't know the history. Um, in fact, St. Augustine, uh, 1500 years ago, had already worked out that there was no time before the, the world had been created. All right, St. Augustine didn't know anything about the Big Bang, but he did have the mouse to work out that time was a property of this universe and therefore must have been made along with everything else. And the fact that there was no time before God created the, the world didn't worry St. Augustine. In fact, it, it really knocks cosmologists to find that a theologian got there 1,500 years before them. Um, why didn't it not worry St. Augustine? Why doesn't it worry theologians today? The, the, the thing is that uh, theologians make a clear-cut distinction between two words, origins and creation. When you talk about the Big Bang, all you talk about are origins. How did the world originate? That has nothing to do with creation. The creation question is not how did the universe begin. The creation question is why is there something rather than nothing? A different question. Why is there something now? Why are we here now in 1996? You know, what's keeping us in existence now? That is why theologians, when they talk about God the Creator, they always couple it with God the, the Sustainer. Because um, God's creativity is equally invested in all instances of time. T equals not naught has had no particular significance. Right, uh, what else? Um, obviously we're very impressed by the vastness of space and the hugeness of, of all these physical objects around us, these stars and galaxies and so on. Um, and we aren't anything like as important as the sun. Not in the context of physical things. You know, after all, it's we who go round the sun, the sun doesn't go round us. So in that context, the sun is clearly very much more important than we human beings. And all of us would like to be important, yes? So let me ask you the question, well, in that case, would you like to swap places with the sun? The answer obviously is no. Why? Because it's no fun being the sun. You're important, but you don't know you're important. In fact, you don't know anything. Which brings us to the, the, the fact of consciousness and where that should be starting to figure in our, our thinking about the cosmos and so on and our place in it. Blaise Pascal uh, said, Man is only a reed, the weakest thing in nature, but he is a thinking reed. He goes on to say that Nature might one day destroy mankind, but mankind would be more noble because mankind would know that he was dying, whereas nature would not know anything of its achievement. So, where does consciousness come into things? Obviously, it's got something to do with the brain, and the brain is very complex. In fact, rather than be thinking in terms of size, as it regards importance, you know, thinking in terms of size is rather silly because oh, right, we are very small compared to the sun, but we're very large compared to an atom. So, you know, what constitutes being big? Many people think that the most important thing about us is complexity rather than size. And that what we've got up here is probably an example of one of the most complex pieces of matter in the entire universe. So that's one thing to be proud of. The second thing to be proud of is that for some reasons that we don't understand, when you get this degree of complexity, it's accompanied by consciousness. And that seems to be something of incredible importance. Whether the, the study of the brain, you know, the neuroscientists are going to um, uh, uncover 
this connection between consciousness and what is happening physically, one doesn't know. In, in my tours, as I was going around uh, having conversations with a vast number of, of uh, scientists and philosophers and theologians in, in connection with the science and one of the series, I came across very, very few people who hold out any hope at all that one could simply explain away consciousness in terms of the movement of atoms and the flows of electricity. It seems that, so far at any rate, if one's to do uh, greater justice to what it is to be a human being, you've not only got to talk in terms of the, the physics of this body, or the biology of the body, you've got to think in terms of the psychology of what's going on as well. We need to adopt two languages. A language of physics, where you're talking about atoms and electricity and mass and space and things like that. And another kind of language which is based on an entirely different set of concepts, such as uh, pain and fear and love and intention and hope and that sort of thing. Those sort of concepts don't figure in any physics book and it's very difficult to see how they will ever figure in a physics equation. So certainly for the time being, we simply seem to have two sets of languages and we need to be able to use both these sets in order to do justice to what it is to be us. I mean, I've talked about um, the fact that we are a very complex and advanced form of life. Looking more to the future, as we can part of the title, um, where, are, where are we evolving to? Um, you know, we, 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 when, you, when you look back, you know, we're obviously very proud of the fact that we've evolved from very primitive beginnings. So, are we evolving to something like a, a superhuman race? So are, are superhumans in the future going to look back on us the same way as we look back on our ape-like uh, predecessors? It's a very open question, that. In, in one uh, thing we have to bear in mind is that to a large extent we are thwarting evolution. If you very sort of crudely characterize evolution by natural selection by, say, you know, survival of the fittest, well, with all our medical science, we're bending over backwards to prevent, in inverted commas, unfit people from dying. And so, are we in fact saving up trouble for ourselves as a race? Uh, on the other hand, we have the Human Genome Project, where we are mapping out <coughs> with all the human genes in, 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 in the DNA. If this opens up the possibility of genetically engineering people to order, you know, if you find an, an aggressive gene, perhaps you can just sort of snip that bit out, and you don't, don't have aggressive people after that if you think that that's a good thing to do. What kind of creatures could we produce in that way? Or another thought to be borne in mind is what about nuclear holocaust? You know, we're so clever we have discovered nuclear bombs. <coughs> now, in your when you're thinking about evolution, you're thinking about long periods of time, sort of a million years or so. Who would like to be sure that the human race would still be here in a million years' time? Will we not have blown ourselves up one way or another? In fact, is that not the scenario which is perhaps worked out time and time again throughout the universe? Doesn't matter which planet you have, you eventually get a form of life which is sufficiently clever to develop language, share experiences, an explosion of knowledge, you discover nuclear power, and that's it, you've had it. So we might be an example of, of the most advanced form of life that ever appears anywhere in the universe. <coughs> in any case, the sun is going to uh, expand in, in, in 5,000 million years, it's going to become a red giant, so uh, we're going to be all fizzled to death here anyway, so uh, life here on Earth is, is going to stop, and eventually throughout the universe it's going to stop because there's going to be a great heat death, everything's just going to burn out. Now, some people get terribly worried about that, it doesn't worry me at all because um, I, I, I look upon myself as a piece. Well, a, a modern day uh, analogy is a piece of software in a computer, okay? Now this is my personal computer, I have a software which is the real me, and just as you can transfer software sometimes from one computer to another. It's <laughs> difficult, it's difficult. I expect eventually to end up in some other kind of computer. Um, how it's done, I don't know, I just leave that to God. Um, 
Anyway, if, if, if you have that in, in mind as, as the long-term future of the individual, then the, the fact that you know, eventually life in this universe uh, conks out doesn't seem to worry me at all, because I, I very much look upon uh, well, someone said that this life is a kind of veil of, of, of soul making or mixing my analogies it is a kind of uh, uh, mold in which you, you create spirits and uh, once the spirits have been, been made you can break the mold in fact when you've broken the mold it means that the additions you've got so far become more valuable by the fact that the mold is now broken so I, I'm actually quite uh, optimistic for the future thank you very much thank you Well, I, say, so I hope that Russell's sold software is more reliable than Windows 99. <laughs> 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 experience is good. <laughs> well, well, now it's a great pleasure to introduce our, our second speaker, Professor Irving Laszlo. Um, this is the first one I've had the pleasure of meeting. Well, his name is very well known for me for a number of years. He is uh, the president of the International Society for System Sciences, who, although it sounds impressive, hardly actually does justice to the, the scope of the things in which he's worked. He is perhaps par excellence, the example of someone in our current time who really has uh, reached uh, the problem of, of branching across all the sciences. I say very few people do this, very few people have the courage to come out publicly and do it, and uh, he's written some very interesting and exciting uh, things, and some of these perhaps we will hear about this evening. He's the editor of a journal which is called World Futures, which is not in fact about the stock market. <laughs> it's subtitled The Journal of General Evolution, which gives you a better idea of what it is about. His recent books, uh, dealing with this process of able objective vision of nature and reality, are called The Whispering Pond, which is his personal vision of the emerging, sorry, personal view on the emerging vision of science, and of a somewhat more technical later, the interconnected uh, nature of the interconnected universe, the conceptual foundations of the de- transdisciplinary unified theory. So that gives again the idea that he really is trying to link across sciences in a scientific way. So it's very pleasure to be to invite Professor Laszlo to address us this evening on the subject of Mr. Life and Soft. Thanks very much. Thank you very much uh, for this nice introduction and I enjoyed so much hearing Russell broadcast, as it were, his views uh, over a very wide range uh, and uh, being, I think, very intriguing at the same time. I'll cover some of the same ground. I'll keep off, just as he did, from the uh, uh, topic of soul per se. I think we should leave it to theologians, as I'm open to discussion on the topic. But I'll be happy to deal with life and consciousness and mind that's a little bit chunk, I think. I'll go, for example, uh, lighter on the question of matter. Uh, uh, since that we have two physicists here, so that's their territory, if you know. Uh, they try to cross territories these days. All right, uh, being a philosopher of science, basically, and therefore not having a privileged territory, I have to move all around and I try to get an overview. And what strikes me is that uh, even though it may be just a personal view, that uh, science is not a uh, search for eternal truths. In fact, there are very few eternal truths that one finds. Uh, everything is open to question. That probably every time one finds an answer, you raise more questions than you have had before. But, on the other hand, there is a sense of progress. Science expands. Expands in the sense that uh, there are now discussions of more and more questions. From the beginning of the universe, and I'll be a bit controversial, and I'll say possibility that you can even have multi-cyclic universes in which you case you would have something before this particular Big Bang, it wouldn't be the Big Bang, it would be the Bang. But it's a possibility. Uh, so it's moving, it's moving in time, it's moving in space, in these enormous distances that you just uh, discussed. It's moving in terms of depth of penetration here, as both of my colleagues are moving down to the quantum level, and the floor of inquiry is getting ever deeper in terms of moving into this planet domain, moving into the micro time domain also, recalculating what happens in, uh, in uh, 10 on the minus 35th of one second, which was the planet time, and also moving into different levels of complexity. 
we're moving from the physical level to the biological level, which is classical, the social, psychological level, all of these are classical levels. However, there are now ways in which you can at least envisage the way these things hang together. It's, reason, it's a reasonable assumption, actually, academic discipline, so who always think that this is my field, never mind uh, anything else, just stay in your field and everybody else keep out. But it's, still, it's a reasonable assumption that all the phenomena that we observe today somehow emerged in the course of time and in space. If we had anything like the big bank, or a bank, or a succession of banks, uh, obviously there was a beginning to this process. Whether we want to put it as a beginning of time and space, I think there's a reasonable argument. You could also say that those are human measurements that you left to put, and there's a beginning to do something else which underlies time and space, such as fields, possibility. That is a philosophical perspective. You can get into them if you like. However, everything that you know in the world as possibly existing had a beginning at one point. Now, this is contrary, obviously, to the uh, creationist thesis, which says that it was created and it has eternally been such as it is now, or has been created because of the given time, and since that time it's like that, and perhaps will be forever like that, perhaps until a final last judgment or some other final event. In the natural universe of the natural and empirical sciences, I think the real question is not what that thing is in it and by itself, but how it has come to be. So it's basically a developmental and dynamic and evolutionary view. That's a very great difference from the kind of Newtonian perspective that you had heard from our chairman mentioned a moment ago about still biologists and to some extent actually at economists, social scientists are still trying to think in terms of mechanistic, uh, mechanistic concepts. How like a machine one thing interacts with another and how you can obviously reduce complexity then to the behavior of the individual element in it. What's emerging is a twofold change or a twofold development in science. One is the dynamic evolutionary perspective. A developmental perspective, things are changing in space and in time, and things become what they are, and they continue to become something else. They may disappear, they may further evolve, but they don't stay what they are now. And the other perspective is that what they think is in itself is becoming, becoming increasingly difficult, perhaps even impossible, and I would say even pointless to ask. Because I think in itself is such a total abstraction that in this world that we can cope with in the sciences, it just doesn't make sense to speculate about it. Not even if it's a human being. Even a human being is in some sense what it has been in its environment from the time in, this, in his uh, or her mother's womb to the time it's growing up in a family, in an environment, in a society, in a culture, in nature, etc. So everything is formed to some extent by interactions. Everything becomes as a series of simultaneous and sequential complex chains of interactions. Now this means that uh, we are developed going from the typical classical empiricist viewpoint which tries to identify single objects and perhaps have causal interactions found to Hume perhaps as this is a famous called the theories of A it impacts on B like in a billiard ball, impacts a movement to it, then B impacts on C, etc. Causal chains. We are moving into a view of a kind of causality which is much more complex. Not only one thing acts on, a, on another, but a whole set of things acts on each one of them. So in addition, just to use a current term, uh, in addition to what has been now this called the classical causality is being called the upward causality, upwards causality, where one thing acts on another and another and another, you know, 
in a kind of fetching, you also have the reverse, you also have downwards causality, whereby a system of interacting parts acts on each of these elements. And this is true when you think of the human being, as so it's a family, that's the whole, as it's a society, as it, when you think of nature, when an ecosystem acts on all of its elements, it's true of the biosphere, it's probably true of the universe as a whole. It certainly is true already on the most basic level of the physical universe, where certain elements, like the famous quarks, which is Galman's expression of this semi-theoretical uh, concept, which is supposed to be the unit of the which particles are constituted, but quark doesn't exist in itself. There is no such thing as a single quark. Quarks are collective beings. And therefore, if you, a similar thing could be said with some less uh, drastic <coughs> measures of collect collectivity about particles, where I think if my distinguished colleagues would come correctly, or I can add on to this, it's, it's very difficult or impossible to establish the, in, in any definitive sense the state of a particle without taking into account, first of all, the indeterminacy, but also the state of other particles state of nucleus and nuclei plus whatever other systems that are around the particle. It's always the system as a whole which determines the part. So there is a mutual determination. Uh, I just want to make two points by the introduction that let me move on very quickly. One was the rise of a dynamic evolutionary perspective. The other one, the rise from the atomism or change from the atomism to what you might call systemism or holism. Holism is a metaphysical notion uh, where it says the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. I would say the whole is different from the sum of the parts in any case. And very often you can't tell what the part is until you also know what the whole is. So uh, these are changes that are occurring whether scientists who work in the field often realize it or not, sometimes they don't realize it, but on the whole people are using these newer kind of concepts. I find this change quite radical, quite noteworthy, uh, in the 1960s, when I really became seriously involved in research and publication and teaching in, in, in philosophy of science, I started working with the ideas of uh, general systems theory, for example, with Ludwig von Bertalant, whom I knew very well personally, and Rappaport and, and Ken Bolding and other people. These ideas were considered rather maverick ideas on the fringes, very crazy kind of ideas systems, you know, what is a general system and so on. Today, systemic thinking is becoming mainstream, especially in the so-called sciences of complexity, which is going upwards from the biological sciences and up probably, into the human and social sciences. Evolutionary thinking likewise. I mean, there was a question still in the 1960s whether the universe is a steady state or quasi-steady state or something like that. Since then, I think the, the idea that the universe evolves as well and evolves irreversibly has become a very dominant notion. Very few people will hold on to the concept that we really have an absolutely stationary kind of a situation where everything stays the way it was eternally. Although there may be theoretical questions here on the, on, on the quantum level where time has a different meaning. But on the whole, overall, you have a progression in this universe from the simple to the complex, from the very minute to the larger. Systems build into systems, form super systems. And this is how perhaps you can understand best the fact that in this very curiously self-organizing universe, uh, atoms can form into molecules, can form into macromolecules, can into crystals, and they can form in turn into the proto by a protocellular forms of life, which in turn can join together into multicellular forms and ecological forms and biospherical forms and so on. It seems to be a sequence, a hierarchy, a nested hierarchy of systems and system building up. Uh, I will just put in a little footnote that I would love to get into a little discussion on the entropic principle also because we have heard from us that two different alternatives to the explanation of these coincidences. I think there is a third, but perhaps we can get into a uh, discussion in a moment. But let me get on to uh, how this what this implies for life very briefly and then what this implies for mind and consciousness. Life is still biologically considered by biologists, by mainstream biologists, is considered a series of accidents. I think the avant-garde, really the cutting edge of theoretical biologists no longer holds up to this. 
there's such a thing as neo-Darwinism, neo-neo-Darwinism, and even post-Darwinism, and this is sometimes called developmentalism as well. Many people are championing this. If you look, I think this is where the cutting edge lies. The main difference is this. In the classical notion, you have a set of genes forming the genome, which is in insulated and isolated from its environment. It is producing randomly different configurations of its uh, molecular components, the genetic components, and these are mutations. Some of these mutations produce blueprints, which create the body, the phenotype, and these phenotypes sometimes happen to fit the environment better than the previous ones, and then obviously they have an advantage and they start to produce it more, and they, this piece is that replaces the previous one. So there's typing mistakes which get lucky typing mistakes which get reproduced, get zeros as it were, and they are the ones that will carry the day. Okay? Now, this notion gives you a double play for chance a double role for chance. On the one hand, you have random mutations. Nobody controls what they are. And on the other hand, these random mutations are randomly interacting with the environment. If, the two, if these double chance events work out, then you have what Dawkins called the blind watchmaker producing all the phenomena of life. My problem with this is that this is probably would require a, a, a level of time the dimension of time far longer than was available on Earth. It may be longer in some estimations than the age of the universe. Uh, there's not much, so much difference. I mean, after all, uh, uh, there was uh, 3.6 to 4 billion years available for life to be to evolve on Earth, and the age of the universe may be 15 billion years, but some estimation is only 8 billion nowadays. You know, so you know, the was very big. But uh, anyway, life has started fairly early, so to speak. It has started almost as soon as it could so to speak. But even if it had, even if it had this considerable amount of time at its disposal, it's difficult to see how it could develop by random events. So the alternative to that is some form of interconnected mutations, adaptive mutations. Pre-adaptive mutations going too far, but people are playing around with a kind of a revised form of Lamarckism, the notion that even an inherited uh, trait, I mean, rather, an acquired trait can be inherited in some way. In other words, that uh, the, the, the genome is not entirely insulated, not entirely, this mutation not entirely subject to chance, but maybe they interact in some way, maybe they are responsive in some way to the inputs, to the effects, to the influences, the radiations, the experiences of the body, of the species, of the actual phenotype, you know, the actual the developed species. So maybe there's an interaction between the phenotype and the genotype. One talks nowadays about the fluid genome. Fluid genome meaning the subject to change, open to change. A number of experiments have shown that certain kind of radiation produce what is known as directed change in flax, in bacteria, and so on. And so this is one possibility. A further possibility is that, that the environment themselves are not entirely haphazard interacting because the environment of a species is also part of a larger system. And this overall system interacts with each of its components. So people like, uh, like Gould, uh, for example, and Eldridge and some other people talk about the hierarchic interactions. One level of the hierarchy is the overall ecosystem. The bottom hierarchy or level of this particular hierarchy is the uh, gene itself in chromosomal structure. No. And the two things are interconnected in some way. Top-down causation in addition to bottom-up. Roger Sperry talked about top-down causation in terms of the mind. Now people are, Polanyi was talking about top-down uh, uh, causation, top causation in terms of the uh, sphere of the life, of the living, because the whole system seems somehow to affect the parts. By the way, another little footnote here, if you don't want to make this completely metaphysical and unacceptable, you have to assume that there is some way in which the whole can communicate with its parts. No problem when it comes to a single body, because you assume that there will be chemical interactions to somehow communicate the effect from the overall system to its parts. The little problem here is that sometimes these interactions are far faster than what could be communicated biochemically. So there seems to be field phenomena. 
and I can get into more details on this, a very interesting argument how consciousness can act on the brain, and some of the processes spread in the brain almost simultaneously, certainly faster than they could spread through the, uh, uh, through the synapses. And then drives are very good stuff that Peter can uh, uh, tell us something more about it. Now, you might also then assume that there is perhaps a field interconnecting the ecosystem with the species, and possibly even with humanity. Well, let me then get to the last bit, and then I'll be uh, done uh, with this preliminary remarks. The last bit is humanity and the human mind. Consciousness, yes. Consciousness has somehow evolved in this species. Why this first evolved has also some fairly good, good reductionist arguments. I wouldn't say all reductionist arguments are dead. And this is a possible <coughs> argument saying that uh, at one time our forefathers, for reasons that are not fully understood or suspected, had to descend from the trees where they were surrounded by other species that were faster and better on the ground than they were. They had to rely on something else than speed and the acuity of eyes. They had to rely increasingly on something that came to be known as intelligence. And intelligence therefore had developed on a higher level in the species. Ultimately, they had to rely on, on communication among themselves so the rudimentary sign language of animals had to develop and intervention into symbolic language, develop symbols. With having a symbolic language at disposal, you can identify the world around yourself. You can do something more. You can also identify yourself in the world. You now have words for things. You say, aha, uh -huh, man, woman, animal, rock. And you say, me, the name. And all of a sudden, you have the basis for reflective consciousness. Now, this may have had a, a, a functional origin, but you can't explain consciousness simply in terms of its functionality because it was far deeper than that. And there are many puzzling phenomena today about consciousness that cannot be explained in terms of functional utility. Again, the details would take us too far afield. Let me just mention that one of the greatest minds that have foreseen these dimensions of consciousness is perhaps being rediscovered today is perhaps Carl Jung. One element of this are the archetypes, another element is, is the collective unconscious, and the third element are this, what we call the unus mundus, which is this sort of the ground, the rational ground that underlies the mind and which connects all things together, even synchronicities. This phenomenon is far more complex than pure functional utility for survival. In fact, survival, as we just heard, has become very questionable when you have a conscious species. This is a very poor survival strategy for a species. So ultimately, perhaps our consciousness is something else than just a means for enabling us to reproduce. We could do that much simpler. So uh, where should we go? Let's look this to the future. I would just... Uh, put in one additional element to what you've already heard about the future. Given this vision, which is essentially one of interactions producing systems, producing evolution, and all of this, the individual, the element, is part of this tremendous dynamic wave of, mo of movement, which is a non-deterministic movement, I should add that, not a mechanistic movement, where at any point extinction is, possi is possible, at any point fluctuations are possible, instabilities are possible, and chaos is possible in a modern sense at least of a highly indeterministic state. But we are part of such a system, and we are not on top of it, as it were. We are not external to it. We are not observers of it. We are in it. We are it, in a sense. If you think of this uh, overall system in which we live, uh, not by accident as a notion such as Jim Lovelock's concept of Gaia becomes so popular. Because actually expresses something that is an ancient intuition also. That the overall system has some kind of a reality. The overall system is something which gives us the context. It's our community. A communion with it uh, in quasi-theological terms, if you like. We live within it, we are a part of it. We thought we are different from it, but we thought that we are different from it and abstract from it and separate from it only in the 
context of the last 350 years, basically since Francis Bacon and the whole ideology, uh, then with the empiricists, then with Descartes, dualism, and so on. Until then, the intuition was that the human mind is somehow part of nature. And we are recovering, I think, this, this insight that we are a part of it. Therefore, our future is very strongly bound up with the future of this overall system. Without going into detail here, let me just mention that this overall, the future of this overall system is now highly questionable, it's highly open at any rate, because we are disturbing very age-old, very long-established equilibrium systems, dynamic processes or self-generative processes, whereby we are producing different conditions, different equilibria, and the system may change. The system may or may not change in a way that's favorable to humanity. It's entirely possible that in the end of the next 20, 50, perhaps 100 years, the system will change in ways that will make it less favorable already in terms of agriculture um, and, and habitable space and, and drinkable water, breathable air, etc. For this particular species, which is highly vulnerable, a reed, as we just heard, to survive in the system. So we have got to be very careful not to look at the future as something that's going to happen, but as something that is open. There's something that we can still create. We can still, I think, at this point, create a positive, a livable future for our children and our grandchildren. We can also destroy the possibility of survival, if not for all people, then at least for the 8 or 10 or 12 billion people, a thousand million people who will come into this world unless there is a major population collapse before that, which is in itself a great danger and a very inhuman scenario. Looking into the future, it's good to have this systemic evolutionary view. We are part of the system, we are sitting at the threshold of a so-called bifurcation point and instability. We can as yet steer a course. And if you become aware that this is a choice that we face, I think considerably we can steer still a positive, a humanly positive course. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Well, my thanks to both speakers for their excellent talks and also for their excellent timekeeping, which is a chair, it's a great relief <laughs> if people finish on time. Um, we now have to have, please, to suggest that we have some sort of mediated discussion between the two speakers, but also later on we have questions from the floor. To give me some idea so I can balance these two, could you indicate how many people would like to ask a question? Okay, so that's a reasonable number. That's a reasonable number. Um, would the organiser be happy if we took one of the questions and used that to prime the... I think maybe just ask, ask if they've got anything to clarify, but yeah, I'm dropping principal questions. Well, I can touch several themes, I can yeah. 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 Well, and let me first of all ask whether you both would like to say anything briefly in response to the other person's talk. Very quickly, um, a small point. Ellen mentioned the possibility of an oscillating universe, which I, I didn't um, mention in my talk. Uh, that certainly uh, is a possibility that the, the Big Bang was not the creation of the universe. Um, that what we have is a scenario where you have a Big Bang. Uh, the, the, the universe then re-collapses down into a big crunch and then bounces back, in which case what we have been calling the Big Bang would simply be the most recent of the big bounces, in which case there would have been time before the Big Bang because it, it did not mark the, the origin of the universe. However, that still isn't good news for a, a naive understanding of, of the Creator because uh, most people think that on that scenario, this series of oscillations would in fact go back forever, so that there wouldn't actually have been a beginning. So they think that that gets rid of God the Creator, but it doesn't because it's, it's a business use of the word creator, as I mentioned before. Um, I was interested in uh, what you were saying earlier about um, the concentration on interactions. Uh, this is certainly something which is very much um, part and parcel of what's happening in, in, in modern physics. Um, particularly quantum physics, uh, when you, I mean, you used to ask the question, uh, you know, what was an electron? Was that, well, that, that was a very difficult question to answer because 
It's when you fire an electron out, it behaves like a little particle, and when it arrives at its destination, it behaves like a particle, so you started off waiting that it was a particle. But then, as it travels between its starting out point and its, its final interaction, it behaves like a wave, so it somehow it does this Jekyll and Hyde thing. And so it raises this big problem of how can something be a tiny particle at the same time be a spread out wave. The way most people get around this now is to say, well, it, what we're doing is misusing language when we talk about what something is. That we really have to concentrate purely on interactions because that is, in fact, all that we ever have experience of. So the, the electron behaves in a particle like way when you're asking, how is it going to interact? If you're going to ask the question, where is it going to interact? You know, where is the next interaction going to take place? Then you must use the mathematics of waves. That the concentration is always on interaction rather than talking about what the thing is in between the interactions. Uh, and holism is certainly part of, of quantum physics these days. We, we, we now know that if you have two electrons and they bounce into bang into each other and then part, and you start to do an experiment on one of those electrons, it, it, it in fact behaves as though the two electrons are part of a single system. They do not behave as though they are separate. That they, they, they are a single two-particle system rather than two systems of one particle each. How this comes about, we do not understand. It's just the fact of life that we have to, to hang on to and, 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 and live with. Uh, I have a question for you. Uh, uh, um, I, I was um, very puzzled about this business about the mark sort of coming back in, 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 into oh, it again. Right. The, uh, the idea that uh, acquired characteristics could be passed on. It, 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 is there any sort of idea as to how mechanically this is done? You know, is the, the suggestion that if a giraffe, for example, spends all its life sort of stretching its neck to get to, to, to the fruit, that somehow that then changes the molecular structure of its genes so that its offspring then start with a somewhat longer neck because of the efforts put in by the, the parent? No, that's, that, that's, that's, classical. that's classical anarchism and I don't think people would uphold it today. So I understand uh, from this experiment what uh, seems to be occurring that certain kinds of uh, bio, uh, chemical as well as electromagnetic fields and impulses that, to which the organism is, organism is subjected seem to produce accelerated mutations. And some of these mutations seem to be preferentially adapted to the kind of disturbance which has produced them. In some cases, for example, when you have uh, uh, exposed to uh, these radiations, flax or bacteria, you get preferred mutations. Mutations of the kind to which uh, enable the bacteria to survive. One famous experiment was made with lactose, for example. You know, they, they produced a, a species of, of bacteria that couldn't digest, uh, 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 didn't have the gene for lactose. Then they give it an exclusively milk diet. So the poor bacteria won't expect to starve. And now, uh, it turned out that in a series of experiments, a surprisingly large number of bacteria have actually mutated the gene for the digestion of lactose. Now, if this was purely by chance, the, the odds would have been astronomical, but the time, again, would have been much, much larger, you know, several dimensions larger. So there is some interaction between the uh, input from the environment and the kind of mutations that occur. Perhaps still an indirect interaction, but certainly not the giraffe uh, just stretching. Mm -hmm. yeah. well, I would like to actually ask you both a question and then we'll move to the general audience. Um, well, something that always fascinates me when I hear these types of discussion, and I'd like to put you both on the spot about it. Um, Assuming that we agree that there is a need for development of a way of thinking about reality in such a way as to incorporate together the three topics we are talking about tonight in some sort of single coherent way, would you judge 
that this could be done essentially with our current actual knowledge of science? Or does it require what really is a radical new development in science itself? If I may pick this up, um, when Russell was speaking, for example, he talked about different languages. And there's a certain implication in that that to some extent the challenge is to sort out how philosophical analysis of existing knowledge and how we see it in existing laws of physics rather than actually seeking radically new laws of, of physics. Whereas when you were talking about things like universal fields, I would say to myself, if there were such a thing, that would actually be a radical change in science itself, potentially comparable to the changes we saw at the beginning of this century involving quantum theory and, uh, and special relativity. So it really were the case that there was a field coupled to consciousness in some way, uh, it would be, I think, uh, for physicists, uh, a totally challenging new concept. So can I ask you both to give your comments on this? This particular point often arises in the debate on science and religion too. Um, can we understand the problem that's conceived to exist between science and religion with our current knowledge of science? Uh, is it a philosophical problem only? Or is there really a need for a shift in science itself? Can I ask you both perhaps to pick up that point? I, I think that this is sort of touching on, on the very sort of fundamental question as to what do we mean by explanation? You know, we're obviously in the business of, of trying to explain things. But you no, know, I often wonder whether we would recognize an explanation if we came across it. You know, what, what do we, when do we feel we've got an explanation? And I think that we have to revise our, our ideas as to what constitutes an explanation. And, and to a large extent, I'm influenced here by, by Bohr. Um, I, I touched very briefly on this business of the wave particle duality. Now, when these somewhat apparently contradictory question, uh, experiments were being done, some which seemed to indicate that the electron was a particle, some indicating that it was behaving like a wave, um, the, the sort of uh, common sense, in inverted commas, way of explaining what was going on was to say, well, really, you know, really, the electron is a particle. It just gets a bit sort of wavy at times. Or, alternatively, the electron really is a wave. It just gets a bit gritty at times. Or, it's, it's a particle which has got a wave attached to it. Now, those are those kind of common sense ways of thinking, meaning that they are sort of extensions of the kind of thinking that has served us well in the past. Now, Bohr came up with something quite different. He said that the, the explanation did not come in, if you like, the triumph of either the particle side or the wave side. What you have to think in, in, in terms of, if you want the fullest understanding of an electron, then you've got to hold simultaneously in the mind both the particle concept and the wave concept. Now that seems untidy to most people, but I think that Bohr was right. And I think myself that when we are trying to understand what it is to be a human being, we have, to, I, 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 we certainly have not at the present got a unified way of talking about it. And I suspect myself, though in my years to come, prove me wrong, that we're no, never going to get a completely unified way of looking at a human being. What we're doing at the moment is we adopt a certain kind of language, the language of physics and chemistry and so on, and we describe this physical body, and this kind of way of talking about me is very useful and important. If, for example, uh, I'm in the hands of a surgeon, I want him to treat me exactly like uh, a piece of meat and all the rest of it, and, and, and you know, put in spare legs and things of that kind, of, whatever is necessary. There are those contexts where to think of me and to talk about me purely in terms of atoms and electricity and chemicals and as a physical object is absolutely right. But then there are other situations where that type of talk is not at all helpful. I've got to think of myself as, as a, a psychological entity where I'm uh, a whole uh, mixture of ex the psychological experiences and, and mental experiences, that kind of thing. So that there is that second language which I believe is saying 
in other contexts, very important things about me. And indeed, I would go further and say there is a third language, which I call the spiritual language, where I again think of myself in, in the context of now not so much interacting with, with, with the physical world or with the mental world, but interacting with God and interacting with other people at a spiritual level. And at that level, uh, in, in that kind of language, you're dealing with, with yet a third set of, of, of questions about me, which is to do with ultimate purpose. Now, if I try to think of you know, what makes me, then I have in mind these three sets of languages, each of which uh, uses different concepts and addresses different questions, all of which I Okay, thank you. Okay, I will take the complementary uh, aspect of this, if you don't believe I'll be part of the other way around, uh, in the sense that you ask, what is an explanation? I will ask, what is accepted knowledge? Because you ask, do we, can we do it with accepted knowledge, with present day knowledge? And I will say, that's just as hazy as the nature of the particle. Because what's accepted is changing with every time there is a new paper coming out, uh, we don't know yet whether it's going to find a, an echo or it's going to be ignored, in a sense. That's an interesting fact in the psychology or sociology of science, actually. What makes a paper all of a sudden a new hypothesis, you know, being caught up by people and or what makes them ignore it? But an awful lot of new things are being published and new hypotheses are coming forth on all the levels. And therefore, science is in a pretty dynamic state. And it's an ongoing dynamic state, as possibly now with the new instrumentation available, with computers available, with high levels of resolution available, uh, further radio telescopes, etc., available. Uh, this process is accelerated. And of course, also the interaction of the scientific community the world over. So, science is, is uh, basically itself an evolving system. My sense is that science is driven ahead, not by what we know, but what, by what we don't know. There is a, a something that we can't, ex, a, a, can't accept as scientists, that uh, a phenomenon should be anomalous. Uh, the great, great uh, service of Bohr and the quantum a theory, modern quantum theory, is to put a language, at least a mathematical resolution, to problems that are totally uh, incomprehensible in any ordinary realistic frame of reference. The question always is, of course, whether this is some way of handling the phenomena for purposes of calculation, or whether we should inquire further as to what re really lies behind it. Uh, you mentioned Bohr, I, my, uh, the physicist who was my, the greatest influence in my life after Whitehead, who was my major philosopher, was just one letter different from Bohr and its bone, mm -hmm. in a sense. And not the early bone, but the late bone. Because the kind of innovation that we, uh, that we require is something that starts up by being a hypothesis. This rigorously construed it has to be the simplest, the most economical hypothesis that corresponds to a certain set of data which up to now were anomalous. And that hypothesis can now incorporate the anomaly in a way that makes it consistent with what is already known in the field. A very large requirement, obviously, but not an impossible one. Now, if you have this, gradually, for a time being, probably it's going to be ignored. Then the level of anomaly becomes so high in a given field that you have to resort to like the strong entropic principle, for example, which is, forgive me, a little bit crazy, you know, uh, then that is the strongest to search for alternatives. Now, first it opens up, and I'm not in only cosmology, I mean, biology is full of this area, psychology is full of it, psychiatry is full of it, these things. So I think there is a possibility of making progress not by what you already know, but by what you don't know, and by the reasons uh, advancing of hypotheses that can be discussed, open to experiment, open to falsification, and seeing that if eventually there can be an advance of knowledge. Just one other factor in this case, this is a highly non-linear process, in the sense that for a long time there can be accretion, little bits of knowledge added on. Then comes something 
which throws the entire question and the entire um, body of explanation into question. And that comes a search, uh, which Kuhn described at the time in the 70s, this is a mad search for alternatives. And this happens here and there. Yeah. It happens right now, I think, in some areas of ecology, for example, in some areas of psychiatry, neurophysiology, it happens. The whole new ballgame is beginning to come about. It's very exciting. To me, as a philosopher of science, I'm not looking for eternal truth, I'm looking for advance. And I think this period is, is, is terrific. It's a wonderful place to, uh, to live in. <coughs> Thank you. Nice. response. All right, the floor is open to uh, questions. Uh, oh, there you are. Yes, or not? Oh, I'm sorry, you have to come up and, and think about that. For us as human beings to exist on this planet, would you please briefly reiterate what measures ought to be taken, what estimated time span we do have, and if it fails, is it not only that we have met, have been met the purpose of which nature has set us out for, after all, regardless to whether we fail to survive or not? So briefly, please uh, reiterate what measures we do have to take collectively, and is our present system, which we call democracy, or even communism or whatever, equipped for those changes? to adapt in time to do this, that's all. Thank you. Uh, my name is Norbert Roth, I come from Australia. My residence is normally in Australia and I'm Brunel. You're worried in particular about nu nuclear holocaust, is it? No, uh, I'm looking at a broad spectrum of biological suicide. The option is ours our lifestyle, our way of thinking, the way we share, the way we care. It is the way we transport things, it's the way we pack things, the way we con congregate together in masses, mega cities, the way we use water, everything collectively. That was a bit biological, I think. That's I think that you know, here, here we come across um, you know, a great problem, namely that uh, to a large extent we are being required to go against our natural nature. And if, if we see ourselves as um, in some sense, evolved animals and you can learn a great deal about yourself by looking at the behavior of other animals and what you find with them is that much of their behavior is genetically influenced. Now there are various different patterns of behavior, some of them are, are very laudable if you like, they you know, the love of uh, and care and protection that uh, parents give naturally to their, to their offspring is, is genetically influenced. Uh, but also, uh, one expects to find their aggression and uh, selfishness, self-centeredness. Um, it's all part and parcel of uh, our ancestors' survival kit, you know, and there's very little shelter and food going, then you know, those who grabbed it survived and passed on that, that kind of selfish, self-centered um, uh, tendency to their offspring, and that means you and I. So, I think we start off with this, this tendency to be rather greedy and, and selfish. And you know, there's nothing new about this. Um, you know, Gen Genesis was all about this a long time ago in, in, in terms of the uh, taking of the food, forbidden fruit and taking things which do not belong to you and that you don't need. Um, I think that evolution has in fact provided us with a, a, a very good understanding as to how Genesis got that part right. Um, whether we, we can now, with all the tremendous power that we've got uh, to alter our environment, whether we can mend our ways and in each generation find that strength to, to go against uh, much of our own natural nature, I do not know. I don't myself think that we can do it of of our own accord. I think we need external help, and that's why I see the only kind of help is coming from God. 
unfortunately, we're living in a time where people want to go their own way and, and reject that help. Now, I, I would say that as long as that continues, there is not much hope for us. Well, that's not a conclusion I expected from a cosmologist, but I'm glad to hear it. <laughs> That's such a vast topic that I think will require a different seminar, a different event, actually, to deal with it. But uh, let me uh, just uh, make two points about it. First, the reason for why this situation is very briefly analyzed. Uh, we are living in a life support system which has time sequences that are several magnitudes slower or longer than our own as the change is much, much slower than we do. It takes five to 50,000 years for a new species to evolve. New equilibria takes centuries, no normally to evolve. Our society has changed now, practically from year to year, so in a decade or two decades, there can be major changes, like the information flow that we are getting, the political redraw maps, the new technologies that are coming online, and so on. So basically, we are, with our short-term short rationality, interacting with long-term phases and inevitably we're destroying some of these long-term processes. And some of those processes could be essential for our collective survival. So what is there to be done? Nobody can dictate what's to be done. More information, more knowledge, more realization, more ethics into it. Uh, but I think there are two kinds of things that have to be very clear about. One is we ought to do everything in our power and very quickly to avoid thresholds of irreversible change, irreversible degradation of the environment, whether it's the quality of the air or water, whether it's the advance of the desert or uh, the depletion of natural uh, in among renewable natural resources. I mean, certain thresholds of irreversibility can be foreseen. And once some of those things are done, like a species gets extinct, you can't get it back again. Once a certain type of ecosystem is destroyed, you can't get that it back again. If those things that we are destroying are essential for the collective survival of now almost 6,000 million people moving on with the current rate of demographic growth, so the 8 or 10, then we ought to make sure collectively, very consciously, to stop those processes. That means CO2 in the environment, for example. Things. The sprays have already moderated, but this by not by far enough, and so on. The other things we have got to do is to try to gain time. We have got to slow down some of the processes that are now interfering with each other, make us interfere with each other and with the environment. We have got to come back to some extent to a more considerate, more uh, responsible way of living, way of conducting our business. Voluntary simplicity is one of the kind of things. More efficiency in resource use is the other kind of thing. Buying time, they won't solve the problems, but perhaps they allow us to change, to allow us to adapt to the new conditions. And that's where the help lies. Perhaps this power to which we can apply is not in a transcendent God, but perhaps it's in an immanent God. Perhaps it's in us. And it's called spirituality, and that's my hope. Thank you. Is there a question from the left hand side now? Yes, please. In Poland, I live in England and Brazil, and the rest of the world. My question regards consciousness. I think you, Professor Stannard, said that the poor son is a great thing, that it has not got consciousness, so it's a poor thing. We human beings have consciousness. I wonder. We do have consciousness, doubtless. We have, I think, accepted that animals have consciousness. Many of us think that plants have consciousness. Many of us are beginning to believe that water has a memory, so it has also consciousness. Hmm? Where does consciousness stop? Are we not too conceited? Is that not part of our fold, our mode of life, that we believe that only we, human beings, have consciousness? God as well, of course. But apart from God, only we, human beings, have consciousness. Your comments, please. <laughs> I would certainly think that, that consciousness wasn't a matter of all or nothing. You know, I, I think that um, if we go back over, over the course of evolutionary history, you know, you've got a gradual, uh, with the complexity of the brain, you've got a gradual uh, 
enriching of consciousness and, and, and awareness. So I certainly wouldn't draw a, a hard and fast line between us and, and the animals. Um, but I, I would have thought that the, the consciousness of something like a plant or water was a pretty poor thing. I certainly wouldn't want to swap with it. Hmm? Oh, <laughs> Less trouble, I know. But <laughs> By the way, in the uh, experiments of Stanislav Grof and uh, some other people, and, and, and the regression psychotherapy, uh, people can actually identify with water and plants and animals and so on. And they claim that they feel how, I mean, they know, they actually sense how it feels to be an insect or a dinosaur or whatever. And what the reports are, these are the, uh, actually recorded uh, reports by patients. Uh, I'm not saying that this is, that means that uh, rocks and everything is conscious. What I'd like to say is we should introduce forms, differentiation in forms and in degrees of consciousness. Okay? Certainly degrees you already mentioned, perhaps I don't need to elaborate on, but also forms. We have a particular form of consciousness which I think a fairly good reason to believe is almost uniquely associated with the human, and that's reflective consciousness. And we not only feel something and recognize something, we also know that we feel it and recognize it. That's a kind of a monitor built in. And perhaps some higher animals have the beginnings of this, and this is what gives you identity. This is what enables you to have abstract uh, thought, symbolic language, etc. And this seems to be associated with the neocortex. If you cut out the neocortex, I think you don't have any more this kind of consciousness. It doesn't mean that plants, animals, etc. don't actually perceive the environment and are aware of their perceptions, but not self aware They sense, they feel. I mean, I assume this, because you said that we humans have consciousness, but as a philosopher, I must tell you that I know I have consciousness. I'm not sure you have it. <laughs> because I don't have direct evidence of it. I can only examine your brain and your behavior. You know? I should modify it a little bit, I think I can empathize also. <laughs> but uh, I, I think it's true that we have a particularly evolved form of consciousness that is very seldom matched by others, and, but that the kind of awareness on which it is based may be I'm white heavier, maybe universal in nature. I'm prepared to say in a very primitive, pre, pre-conceptual form, a pre-mind as it's sometimes called. Lately in a book by Ken Wilber and this concept comes up, the pre-mind. Perhaps it's there in the atom, in the molecule. Maybe in the particle, if you could ask him whether it's a wave or a particle, maybe we'll get some. Interesting. Well, <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. Yeah, I, I think you're probably right. The reflective consciousness is, is probably unique to us. But I got a bit worried yesterday because I was driving down to Salisbury and we were going through the countryside and we saw this field of cows. They looked very reflective. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good reason. Should the back is waving his arms enthusiastically. My name is Paul Sheffy, I'm a theologian. <laughs> I am very grateful to both of the speakers for um, enlightening me in all sorts of ways. And I noted that uh, Russell Stanard said something about mental events and brain events. My, my hunch is that you can't have mental events without brain events. In other words, when the brain dies, there's no mental event. So it's very difficult to discern what, a, what the difference is between a mental event and a brain event. And that is a question which vexes philosophers about mentalism as well as vexes theologians. But there's another question which I was particularly interested in, which is this question of the soul, which theologians are supposed to have some sort of interest in. I note that uh, we've been updated, theologians have got into the internet, so, so we talk about software, but in the old days, what we used to say is, well, your body is an envelope, and your soul is the letter. And when the, when the body dies, the envelope is put away, but the letter lives on. Alright? I, at the present time, am trying to write an essay, a paper, entitled, But What If We're a Postcard? 
<laughs> I said that was a rhetoric question, so I'll see. We just like to What is your uh, home page on the web? <laughs> I think it's more relevant. Yes. Can I just say that you know, obviously a lot of people um, have, have great difficulty understanding how God can possibly um, give us a resurrected body. After it's, it's not a question of, as you know, of resuscitating this body or anything like that. Um, Paul makes it very clear that we're talking about a, a resurrection body, another kind of body. Um, I think that. <laughs> I, I definitely find it very difficult when I'm faced with someone who says, I'm quite happy to believe that God is the creator of the world and the creator of myself. However, I don't think it's possible to have life after death. Now, I would have thought that to produce this first version of me out of nothing was the difficult trick. <laughs> and God, the creator, has managed to do that. When I think about um, transferring the real me, the essence of me, into some other kind of embodiment. That's just producing a second version of what he's already done, so I should have thought that was chance play. <laughs> God's play. <laughs> yes, really. Uh, Diana Collins, I'm not a scientist or a mathematician, so I hope you'll forgive me if I ask meaningless questions. But um, I did labour through Stephen Hawking's book, and at the end, I was very struck by, he goes on about the search for a unified theory, and if I understand Russell Stannard correctly, he doesn't really think that this is something that is on, that we'll ever find, but perhaps I'm misinterpreting it too. And then the final sentence of it was that when we found this unified theory, we shall know the mind of God. And I thought that was a very strange statement for a scientist and physicist to make. I mean, it didn't seem to me... Well, <laughs> it seemed to be finished. That's the end of everything. And the idea of knowing the mind of God, well, I didn't quite see why we should know it, if, even if we found this unified theory. Let's take a Yes, sorry. Um, I have to be a bit careful when one talks about unified theories. When a visitor talks about a unified theory, um, then what we are saying there is that in our physics, at the moment we have several equations, different kinds of equations, and wouldn't it be nice if, if one day all these different branches of physics could be brought together so that all that I, I as a professor of physics have to do and Chris has to do is to go into a lecture theatre and put up one singular equation and say, well, that, that's it, fellas, that's what it's all about. Any questions? Um, now, that, <laughs> that is, if you like, the gleam in the eye of physicists, and we call that the grand unified theory. But we are only, or we sometimes we call it, the, or some people call it the theory of everything, which I think is terribly arrogant. All that it really means, though, is, is that all the physics will be unified. It's not talking at all about the whole realm of psychology and, and spiritual matters and things of that kind. Um, whereas I think that the, the Bowman is, is um, talking about uh, transdisciplinary unification, which I presume is, is bringing biology and physics together and, and, and mind and consciousness, which is still a voice of human in, 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 in Irvin's eye. So it's, it's something quite different. When you talk about the mind of God, um, yeah, it's a, yeah, yeah, well, yes, but he, he talked about the mind of God. Um, I think that you have to, to realize that uh, some physicists uh, get very sort of um, slack in the way they use the word God. Like, for example, um, uh, Einstein always used this ball, used to say in respect to quantum theory uh, that he believed that God does not play dice. All right. Um, Willie Allen in Mighty Aphrodite he says he thought that God's favorite game was hide and seek, which I thought was rather hard. <laughs> <laughs> um, but when, when, when one talks about God does not, or when Einstein talked about God does not play dice, he, he, he was not referring to a personal God. Um, a God for him was just simply the laws of nature. 
In other words, the laws of nature don't involve inextricably uh, chance. And I think that when Stephen Hawking talks about knowing the mind of God, again, he's using it in that kind of a way that, that when we've got that theory, then we understand nature. Because they don't accept that there is a person to God. And of course, since uh, he coined that phrase, uh, other people have realized that you sell a lot of books if you put mind of God or undoubtedly the mind of God in the title. Yes, well, I don't know, Stephen Hawking, I think you know him personally, Chris, but uh, I know his editors, I know this so happens. Uh, and, and the people who are working with him to prepare this book and have some suspicion that some phrases like this were suggested to him, to put it mildly, um, which is not really come from a scientist. So, um, the problem with this kind of statement, quite independently whether you talk about God or not, is that the following. Suppose you have a truly unified theory. And there is no law of nature why we couldn't have it. If nature is not intrinsically separated into physical and biological and mental domains, inseparably, ir 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 untranscendable uh, uh, separated, then it's our problem to find what they have in common. So ultimately, and I'm not talking about this decade, or not even necessarily about the 21st century. But ultimately, you might have your professor coming down and writing down a set of equations and saying, this is it. This is how you get from Big Bang to human consciousness and to the Gaia system. And I don't think you can forecast, predict precisely, but you can at least give the alternatives. And I even worked out, you know, it's not difficult mathematically, the form in which such an equation will take. Yeah. It's possible. But the pro there is a problem with it. Suppose you have such a theory and it explained everything. Would it be true? <laughs> you think you, you think you have no way of knowing that. The only thing you would know that for the time being, it doesn't have anomalies, but it could always have, and it could be conceivable also. What Mach and Duhamel and Poincaré have always pointed out that there is more than one set of explanations for any, any given phenomenon. You might have another theory that could explain, and maybe the other theory is true. So scientists, I think, should be a little bit modest in that case, in, in that sense. You, know. you try to understand it using the simplest possible explanations. I think that was another nice Einstein quote. We see the simplest possible scheme of thought that will explain the observed facts. He said that, you see, 94. I think that is true. But whether those facts, those explanations are true or not, that you have to leave the theologians. We have time for one more quick question. Let me just say one thing for the last question. That Stephen Hawking has an extremely good sense of humour and likes pulling people's legs. And it's worth keeping that in mind when you read his book. <laughs> one quick question, please, to round off. Yes, please. <coughs> yes, could you hold the mic uh, six inches away? Right. As if you're a pop star. Right. Um, I hope it's not too long. Um, my name is Donald Watson. My comment or question is in two parts, really. <laughs> Throughout the evening, I kept looking back at the title. It's quite common for us in these dialogues to have tripartite elements in the title. Matter, life, soul. We heard a great deal about matter, a fair amount about life, and the soul came in much more during the questions than it did. But are those proportions predictable? And if this new world view is going to emerge, should the proportions perhaps be more equal? And there was one question from Professor Stannard, which he, he left unanswered, which I always like to pass on. Um, is humanity still evolving? I think is more or less what you said. Um, consciousness is perhaps still evolving. If our physi physiological, physical bodies are not evolving uh, very much now, is consciousness evolving more? And has consciousness taken up the process of evolution? And where does the soul come into that? And if we are creating our future, as Professor Laszlo said, is it not the evolution of our consciousness that is hopefully enabling us to do that? And doesn't that hopefully answer the first question as question as well?
I think that um, my own difficulty when, when I was given the brief, you know, with, with the title, I, I, I myself would never use the word soul because there's so much confusion as to what you mean by it. Some people, by the word soul, simply mean mind, and others are referring to the immortal soul, which I would call spirit. So I would talk about mind and spirit because soul can be applied to that. As I didn't know which one it was, I, I said a little bit about mind and a little bit about spirit. Uh, certainly, I wouldn't say that the, the little bit that one said about spirit is, is in any way um, indicative of its importance. Uh, it's, it's more indicative of our ignorance and, and our inability to find much to say about it. Part of the reason for the relative neglect of this term is what we both, I think, both of us said in the very beginning of our talk, that we really prefer to formulate in a different way, not to talk about the soul, but talk about mind or consciousness. It's easier to handle, and that neither one of us here or none of the three of us is a theologian, and therefore we are not really qualified, so to speak, uh, or expert enough to talk about the soul. I myself, as a philosopher, I was be very strongly against dualism. I mean, I, I draw the take idealism or, or reductionism and dualism, I think, is, is an untenable position. So I would not want to separate something. However, just a little bit by way of excuse, I invite you to count the pages in my chapters when I talk about mind, life, and mind. Mind is far longer than any of the other chapters, you see. But the reason we don't really count, haven't spent so much time here, I think, is that we are working our way toward it. I think you can't really just simply pick up the issue and talk about mind and consciousness in a scientific perspective before you have in some sense clarified what you mean by nature, by, by, by the physical world, and by the biological world. Because at least in the evolutionary perspective, mind has emerged in this context. So we have been working our way toward it. And if we could now continue, I'd be very happy until midnight or beyond, to continue entirely on the level of consciousness. There's plenty to say. <laughs> Can I just say that um, uh, in the series Science and Wonders, we, we do get on to the spirit and, and immortal life in the fourth program. It's the third program tomorrow, the fourth program. There's a bunch of last questions. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we quite can't go on to the night. We do have to stop now. Um, I would like to thank you all for your very stimulating questions, which kept us going very nicely. On behalf of you, I'd like to thank our two speakers. Goodness, I think it's been excellent and very interesting. Thank you very much.